Hey everyone and welcome back to another Unreal C++ tutorial and in this video we'll be looking at the radial impulse functionality. So by the end of the video you should have something that will look a little bit like this and you can see what happened there is that as soon as we press start the blueprint actor in the middle was using its C++ component as in the other videos and sending out a radial impulse from the point of the component. So then any of these physics enabled actors were being thrown based on the impulse provided. So as always, if we just click on this, we have a couple of different properties we'll be using. So on the add radial impulse component, we'll be looking at adding the adjustable radius and the adjustable strength. So we have some control over how this acts in the world. And just to get started, as always, if you followed any of the other videos in this playlist, I'll just be using a scene component applying the logic inside of this. So it's just a new sync component if you wanted to follow along exactly. Okay, so to get started over in the header file, what we have here, I have created two different float variables like I've just shown. One named radius, which I've set to a default of 500 and one named strength that I've set to a strength of 2000. Both of these I've just exposed via a U property to be edit anywhere so that we can update this in the blueprints or the editor as I've just shown as well. And the category named forces, just so again, these are always easy to find for us. Over in the code file, this one is going to be a little bit longer because we need to do a couple of things before we can actually get our radial impulse to be applied. So I'll go through this in order as always. What we're going to be doing is creating a few variables to begin with, just so that we have everything ready to populate that add radial impulse function. The first of which is going to be a T array of F hit results named hit array. This will be storing from a sweep trace that we do, all of the objects that we find that we'll be applying force to. So that's gonna be our step after this is to actually apply a sweep trace to find what we have in our radius, which is why we have that stored. Next, I'm going to create two constant F vectors, one named start and one named end. Start is gonna be equal to this, and then the arrow operator to call the get component location function, which is inside of the scene components. And the end vector is just going to be equal to start. Now, of course you could, as we go through this, you'll see that we could have just used start for both the arguments when it asks for the start and the end but just for readability as it doesn't take very much more to implement it this way when it comes to readability it's going to be much clearer that we're going from a start point and an end point when we're creating our sweep trace and our radial impulse okay and then the final thing for the sweep trace i'm not going to go too into detail with these uh, but it is needed to get this working but i have got a topic video specifically looking at the uh, sphere trace functionality. So if you wanted to know more about how and why this is working, then I'd definitely recommend going out and checking that video as well. But the final thing we need is a constant F collision shape, the sphere shape, and this will be equal to the F collision shape make sphere function. And this just needs to know how big the sphere is going to be. So I'm gonna pass in the radius. Okay, so with that done, we can now do our sphere trace. This is of course going to be a Boolean. So I've created a constant Boolean named B sweep hit. This is going to be equal to the get world and the sweep multi by channel. So again, this is the bit that I've shown in a different topic video. But what this will be doing is first of all, this will be filling our hit array. So that's why we have that here. So everything that's found within this sphere will be stored in the hit array. So it will return the actors that it's found. This needs a start and an endpoint to control how big the sphere is. So I'm just gonna set this to start and end. And the reason that we've kept this the same values, so we haven't added an offset, is otherwise you'd actually be tracing two spheres and like a kind of cone in between those two spheres if you have an offset. And I just wanted a standard sphere. Next for the rotation, we don't actually need to rotate this. Of course, this is a sphere, so I'm just gonna use the fquat identity function, which is just going to return a zeroed out rotation. For the trace channel, I've just gone for the ECC underscore world static here. I don't think I've shown that one before, so I just wanted to use a different override there. And then finally, we're using the sphere shape, which we've created. So it knows what type of debug shape to go with or what type of shape to uh, trace within at least. And of course you could set that to things like cubes as well. We're just going for our radial force. So we're gonna add a radial based shape. Then again, just to actually get some feedback to make sure that everything is kind of working as we expect. I've also used the draw debug sphere. This also has its own topic if you wanted to know more about this, but uh, to get this working, we just need to use the get world function 
we want to provide a start point, so where the debug sphere will be drawn, uh, the central point of that is going to be the same as the start of the sweep. So I've passed in start the size of the sphere, we can reuse the radius, so again, all of these are going to match up. The sweep trace and the visualization will always be exactly the same because we're using that exposed variable. We can pass in the segments just to show how detailed this is going to be, and 50 should be fine here. And then finally, we just want to control the color and whether this is persistent. So I've set this to be orange and the persistent lines to be true. So that was all kind of the build up to everything that we needed uh, and the optional draw debug, but everything that we needed to actually get our radial impulse working. So now what we can do, we can find out if our sweep hit has actually hit anything. So if it's worth going any further, so we've got the if B sweep hit. And then what we want to do is for every actor that we've stored in the hit array, or in fact is going to be static mesh in this example, we want to apply force to that. So we're going to use a for loop using the const f hit result, and we'll create a new hit result on each one from the hit array. So every time we loop through, we're creating a new f hit result named hit result. And we're doing this for every element in the hit array. We then want to get the static mesh that we'll be applying the force to. So this is going to be a U static mesh component pointer, and we'll call this one mesh comp. And this is going to be equal to a cast to the type of U static mesh component. We're going to get the hit result, the dot get actor function within this. And then we're just going to find the root component. So we're going to use the get root component on the get actor on, or on the actor that we've returned. Then finally, we can just do a quick safety check. So if mesh component is valid, so if we found a valid mesh component, then we want to say mesh comp add radial impulse, and we're going to provide the start point. So again, we've got this stored, the radius and the strength. So again, the way that I've actually named these, if you were to type this out and get the IntelliSense helper here, the function overrides are actually called radius and strength. So they match up exactly, they've been named in this way to actually work with the add radial impulse. Of course, you could have named them anywhere, but uh, I just thought it would make sense to have the overrides and the variables that I create named the same. We then have control over the type of radial impulse falloff. In this case, I've gone for a constant falloff, so RAF underscore constant. You could, of course, I'll just quickly show you the other options. So you also have the max and linear, and you can get a bit more information about these if you wanted. But the main difference, of course, is just going to be that constant will apply a constant fall off, so it's not going to change, whereas linear will have a kind of drop off and ease to it. And then finally, I'm just going to set the velocity change to true so that we get the full effect of our impulse being applied. And there was one final thing, because we're using our draw debug sphere, I'm just going to scroll up. I have needed to include the draw debug helpers dot h, so the draw debug helpers header file. And as long as you have all of that included, then you should be good to compile and test this one out in the editor. And I just realized now that we're back in the editor, I didn't explicitly mention, but this is all being done on the begin play. So if we press play again, we can see that's why this will take immediate effects. So as soon as we press play, everything's being blown out. The points that we've gone through just to kind of quickly discuss and put everything into context. So we've got the orange sphere here. So that's the 50 segment piece of draw debug helper we've got in the shape of a sphere. Because I set that to be persistent, that will stay on screen forever. If you wanted that to just show uh, very quickly, you could set that to false and you'd need to give it a length of time. But again, all of that is in the draw debug helpers video topic. Then all of the cubes which were lined in that circle are being found within that sweep trace and they are having the force applied to them based on the units that we've got here, which I think was 2000. So of course, what we can do is go back and with the variables that we've exposed, we can change the radius to be bigger. Although of course, that's not actually going to affect anything because these I don't think have the physics enabled apart from this one. But let's give that a go anyway. We'll up the radius and maybe make the force a little bit lower so we don't have the cubes blown completely from the screen. Okay, so if the change is made, we can press play and we can see the updates that we get. And there we go. So yeah, they were kind of thrown more within range and the one that was kind of blasting off in the previous example is now being thrown away because that one is the only one with the forces applied. And just to recap, uh, it's nothing different to the previous videos, but all I've done in the blueprint is actually an exact copy of a previous blueprint, which is why it has the rotating movement component. It doesn't need that at all. We can just remove that. That was just a leftover from the line trace example I've covered. But the main thing is I have a cube just to visually represent it in the level so we know where it is. And I've added the add radial impulse 
on top of this. So that was pretty much all we needed to do. That's the custom C++ component inside of a blueprint just so that we can easily put this in the world and update it. So that is the add radial impulse functionality. Hopefully that's been useful. As always, if you have enjoyed the video or find this useful, please do leave a like and share the video around. That really helps the channel. And just to get this information to as many people as possible. Another way to help the channel if you enjoy these weekly videos and some of the extra content I make on game development is just to hit the subscribe button and make sure you tick the notification bell to get those updates whenever I release any new content. As always, it goes without saying, but a really huge thank you as well to all of my supporters over on Patreon. And I've been talking for quite a while now, so I'll leave the video here. So as always, thanks for watching, and I will see you all next time.